somebody has to live in a place like that. <laughs> it is a complete honor to be here tonight, uh, not only at this uh, great country, this great city, and this uh, great university, the home of Jean Piaget and many other brilliant psychologists to speak here is uh, humbling. But I come to speak uh, on the occasion of the birth of this center of neuroscience and how it's going to bring uh, various disciplines into a common arena, a common area of discussion about the findings and importance of understanding brain mechanisms for many, many aspects of our life and of our culture. The one I, I want to speak about tonight is um, to really represent a large uh, study and conversation that's going on in the United States about the role of brain science, neuroscience, uh, and the law. And as the poster uh, provocatively proclaims, uh, is neuroscience uh, trying to tell us that uh, we are not free from the decisions that we make uh, every day and the important decisions that uh, we make in life? And so the American uh, Foundation, called the MacArthur Foundation, has launched a, a project uh, that includes neuroscientists, lawyers, justices, philosophers, to come and discuss the implications of neuroscience for the law, and perhaps even to carry out research that might disambiguate the law uh, with, uh, with assistance in some area uh, from uh, neuroscience. And the honorary chair, uh, an active chair of the project is uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, the uh, uh, f rather freshly retired uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice of the United States. And there are many people involved in this, over 60 now, uh, and uh, the neuroscientists in the room will recognize such people as uh, Mark Rakel and Robert Desimone and Elizabeth Phelps and uh, many, many others there, Scott Grafton. And the lawyers might recognize uh, some distinguished uh, uh, legal professors, Stephen Morris, uh, Hank Greeley. And uh, then if you've been in trouble, you will recognize the three judges uh, there of the federal court many of them of the federal court uh, in Los Angeles, uh, in San Francisco, and in New York. So it's a real attempt, just like this center here in, in Geneva, your new center, it's a real attempt to have a conversation uh, across the board with all parties present. And uh, of course, this is starting in the context of American law and American courts. And every country is different. Uh, if you were reading uh, last week the, the paper, you, we discovered that in Korea, just this week, they had the beginnings of a first jury trial. So every country is different in how they, they consider their uh, judicial process. And uh, I, I will be telling you from the context of the American courtroom uh, the kinds of issues that, that can come up. And just to give you, to make this very concrete, as the American courtroom is organized, uh, you have at one table the defendant and his counsel. You, of course, have the judge. You have the witness. You have the jury. And then you have the prosecutor. And so just think of the neuroscience questions that are pregnant for all of these dimensions of the courtroom. With the defendant, the question will be, did he do it or did his brain do it? Is he exculpable because of a brain injury or a mental state and the like? With respect to the witness, is the wit did the witness actually see accurately what happened? Or as we know in so many cases, eyewitness testimony is basically useless. But provocatively persuasive with respect to the jury. And the judge and the jury, what are their biases that they are bringing to a judgment? Uh, how are they influenced and the, and the like? And so all of these issues have now a neuroscience dimension. And in some cases, 
too big a belief in how neuroscience uh, may be affecting these processes. In getting to, uh, getting to become familiar with this topic, I've come to know many uh, judges. And uh, they are a very bright group of people. And uh, in the United States, uh, they don't make any money. And that doesn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people. How can a judge not make money when if they went back and practiced law, they would make a lot of money? And finally, it was pointed out to me why these brilliant men uh, who could make money love the judiciary. And it's because they are the only people in the United States that can write those words. It is so ordered. And what flows from that is tremendous. So what are the, the issues? The issues uh, are many, but we're going to focus on two major uh, issues uh, tonight. Uh, and, and what is at stake are, are really uh, modern versions of, of classic questions. And the first one is, does modern neuroscience deepen our ideas about determinism? And with more determinism, is there less reason, reason for retribution and punishment? That's the, that's the dilemma people are thinking about. That is what's going around the universities and the intellectual circuit. That's what's in the mind of many lawyers and justices. And another issue is, is there a set of, uh, this is a, a deeper question, it's an it's a issue that's more into the future, I think, than present, but it, work is beginning on it. And the issue is, is there a set of universal moral principles or are laws a collection of man-made rules? This classic question is now being examined in the neuroscientific setting, and we'll be discussing that as well. So basically then, I want to make these points in the lecture. We're going to look at this question of of determinism and what its significance is for personal responsibility, the free will question. Then we want to look at the kinds of evidence that neurology can bring and cannot and probably should not bring to the courtroom. If we have time, we'll look at uh, uh, two side issues, the role of neuroscience in determining brain death and, uh, and also this issue of bias that I mentioned. And then finally, look at this rather new field of research called social neuroscience, which is examining this question of whether morals are part of the architecture of our brains, every human has it, or whether they're products of social learning and, and culture. And the significance of that for the large concepts, concepts of justice, retribution, and forgiveness. So where did it all start? And of course, if you look on, on the human condition and you look to Europe and you begin with Copernicus, the idea started that maybe man isn't such a big deal. That what we're faced with with Copernicus is maybe everything is not revolving around the earth. And that was a shock. And then when Galileo came along and basically did the measurements which, which proved this. And then Rene Descartes comes along and begins to look at the body certainly as a physical machine, built robots in his gardens. He wanted the mechanics of the biologic system understood and then made his attempts, of course, at understanding the mind-brain problem. And of course, Darwin with his whole evolutionary story and then the story of natural selection and how that works and ultimately finding us here as big animals trying to understand what's behind us and what's in front of us. And Freud saying, well, what's probably on your conscious mind isn't so great anyway. It's probably going on beneath that. And finally along comes modern neuroscience. Just to boom, nail it on the head and say, look here, we really, we really down, down, no mechanisms of mind. And with every finding, there's a greater sense of determinism that we are products of a tight machine. That's kind of the sweep, and that's kind of the thing you hear discussed. 
Well, let's take a step back and, and look why this is so profoundly important. And the first question is, you have to ask yourself is, what are brains for? What are they, what are they for? What do they do? Well, what brains are for is they make decisions. A gazillion million decisions, second by second, moment to moment, minute to minute, day to day, year to year, all it does all the time is make decisions. It gathers information and makes decisions. And we have the deep sense that, yeah, it may be making them, but I'm making them. We each are independently making our own decisions. So think about it. When do these decisions get made as opposed to when we're consciously aware of them? So we'll do an experiment. We can all do the experiment right here. Hold out your hand. Touch the tip of your nose. Now, unless you're uh, nuts, you had the deep sensation that the tip of your finger and your nose were being touched at the same time. And yet we know that the fibers from your fingertip are in me about three feet long, getting to your brain, and from your nose a couple inches. How could, they, how could we have the sensation of simultaneity? It takes time to conduct that information up your nerves. It takes time to get it in from your nose. And it takes different time. And yet there's this deep belief of simultaneity. Well, the notion is that this information gets gathered in some way, in some mechanism in the brain. And after it gets gathered, there's a decision to report out You've been touched, <laughs> OK? Now, what, si what brain science has determined is that that all probably went on 300 milliseconds, 250, 400 milliseconds before you're consciously aware of it. And you, when you think about it, it must have. I mean, your brain is responsible for your moment to moment phenomenal consciousness. In order for you to be conscious of something, the brains already have to have done it. So it has to have gone on at some point, a little bit before you're consciously aware of it. But be that as it may, that's an argument. And starting around 1980, Benjamin Libet started in a series of experiments that have now expanded in, in many, many ways. Benjamin Libet, though, was the first, and he basically showed that if you stimulate the brain in a patient that's conscious, it takes a period of time before you say you feel the stimulation. And this time varies with the experiment and the condition and all that, but basically it's between 350 and 500 milliseconds, a half a second before you're consciously aware. In modern neuroscience on experiments, uh, uh, other experiments where you can record the electrical activity of the human or in neurophysiologic experiments uh, on animals, they can show the decision of an animal is making is prior, 250 milliseconds prior to the behavior. They can predict what is the, what the behavior is going to be on the basis of the signature <coughs> of the electrophysiologic response. So the notion then is that it's all been done by the time we're consciously aware of it. That's the underlying thrust of, of neuroscience. And last year, studies were coming out and continue now in many forms, as you'll see. Uh, studies are coming out that you can actually, using magnetic uh, brain imaging, to measure the intentions and to know what a person is going to do, which act of two acts a person is going to judge prior to them doing it using functional, functional brain image. You can measure the intentions of, of somebody. All of this giving rise and contributing to the determinism and deter the argument for determinism of this, of, of our behavior. 
So let's be specific. Let's absolutely say what people are saying. The brain determines the mind, and the brain is a physical entity. The physical world is determined, <clears throat> so our brains also must be determined. If our brains are determined, and if the brain is the necessary and sufficient organ that enables the mind, then we are left with the belief that our thoughts that arise from our mind are also determined. Thus, since free will is an illusion, we must, so the argument goes, revise our concept of what it means to be personally responsible for our actions. The legal system must change its assumptions. That's not what I'm saying. But that's what's said. That's the, 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 the argument. And for some reason, what's interesting about this is it's okay if our cells the molecular biology of our cells are automatic. And they are. They all work. Uh, okay. right. It's okay. The genes express, they make proteins, they do that, but that we're alive, we're having fun. Right? Everybody wants their cells to be automatic. Trust me. <laughs> now, the neuroscientists come along, some of them, and say, the brain's automatic too. Aha. How about that? Take that. It's biology, it's physics, it's chemistry, the brain's automatic. And that people do not like. That is not a feel-good idea, supposedly. All right? So people try to get around this, smart people, physicists, others, by pointing out well, now, you know, the major models of the brain in neural networks uh, need a little thing in there called a random number generator. It's got to be, this, this noise has to be put in the system for the networks to work. And there's some neurophysiologic data that such things exist in the human, or in brains, human brain as well. I don't think that's where, I don't think that's helpful, and I don't think that's where the issue presents itself. So we're going to pass on to the larger question, even though there's all this force for realizing that our brains are doing these things automatically. None of us believe it. There's not a person in the room that thinks that you came here just because you had to. <laughs> you know, you, great restaurants right across the street. There's all kinds of choices. And, uh, and yeah, I know, I know, but I just feel myself going over to that, <laughs> that thing. Well, so the question is, why do we feel like we're in charge, given that there's a good argument that our brains are working automatically? Well, this allows me to take a two or three minutes to tell you about a piece of research that I did that helps, I think, understand why we think these things, okay? And this work uh, involves the studying of patients who've had their hemispheres divided. They're, we have, each have two hemispheres in our brain. They're connected together by a thing called the corpus callosum. You cut it and the information from one part of the brain can no longer go to the other. The information from the left cannot go to the right. Information from the right brain can no longer go to the left. So you kind of have two, two mental systems in the brain. And over the years, uh, these patients are, are phenomenally interesting. And ba the basic result that we build on is the following. As you see from the picture there, your brain is organized very simply in the visual system. Everything to the right of that fixation point, I guess, do we have one of those? Uh, the mouse well, yeah, the, oh, there, there, there we go. Can you see that? Oh, yeah, there. Oh, there, there we go. There's a fixation point, okay? Now, if everybody in the room fixates on that, that picture of the chicken claw is going to your left brain. And the picture of the snow scene is going to your right brain. 
That's the way we're hooked up. That's the way we're built. All right? Now, you looking at that point say, well, I, I ask you, what do you see? And you would say, well, I see a, uh, a snow scene, a house in the snow, and I see a chicken clock. Right? That's what you'd say. And if you don't see that, come up afterwards and we'll <laughs> have a, a little. <coughs> so, the, so you fixate the point. A split brain patient fixates the point. And all they say they see is the chicken claw. They say, I see a chicken claw. That's it. So the question is, well, what happened to the snow scene? Well, the snow scene was projected over here to the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere is no longer connected to the left dominant speech and language hemisphere. So the patient simply is unaware that the information is presented. That's the basic split brain phenomenon. Now, we then say, well, we want to test non-verbally. We, we won't ask the right hemisphere to talk. We'll ask it, but it can point to, you know, point to the answer, point to pictures. And so sure enough, uh, you devise tests like you see here. And what you're asking is, is for the, each hemisphere to solve this little simple concept test. So you show a picture of a chicken claw, and the left hemisphere, using its right hand, can point to the chicken, which goes with the chicken claw. It, it does a match, okay? And then the snow scene, which is going over the right hemisphere, can direct the left hand to this shovel as the most appropriate choice amongst uh, its four options there, all right? So now the split brain patient has shown this picture, and instead of saying anything, we didn't ask the patient, what did you see? We just said, point to the answer. So the hands go out and point just like you see in the cartoon. Patient's pointing like that. And you say to the patient, oh, so that's nice. Why are you pointing to those pictures? And the patient says, oh, well, that's simple. The chicken claw goes with the chicken. Now, that's the left hemisphere talking about what it saw and, and how it's pointing. And then looking down at the left hand, it says, and you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shed. <laughs> so the left brain is making up a reason to explain this behavior that is coming from the right hemisphere. And it really doesn't know. The left hemisphere really doesn't know why the hand's pointing to that shovel. But do we know every <laughs> reasons why we do everything? We build a quick theory about them. But do we really know the answers? Of course we don't. If you do, come up and see me afterwards. <laughs> so there's this incredible system in the left brain versus the right brain. The, the left brain has this interpretive system. It tries to figure out the pattern of behavior that we are engaged in, the feelings we feel, and the like. Here's an, here's an example of, uh, from uh, another patient, JW. And here's a little video clip. Of it. Again, Joe sees two words simultaneously. Bell goes to his non-speaking right brain. Music to his speaking left brain. When asked to point to a picture of what he saw, he chooses Bell. But when asked why... Yeah, why did you pick that one? Music. Music. And when asked to explain... Yeah. It was music and Bell and... It was two minutes ago, the last time I heard any news, it was coming from the bells out here. Uh -huh. Banging away. So the, the bells yeah. outside here? So, good enough answer to me. What's extraordinary is that Joe's speaking left brain concocts a plausible story of why he pointed the bell, even when some of the other pictures more obviously represent music. So why do we feel free? Well, who's moving this hand? You're not. I see it move, I conclude it's me. Of course, I, I willed it, I picked it up, I'm moving it. We are instant interpreters of our experience, even though these experiences and these movements may be governed by mechanistic systems that are happening before you're consciously aware of it. But we have this thing that is going to tell the story, put the pattern of activity into a narrative, and we develop that so none of us 
none of us actually accept or believe this mechanistic, deterministic notion. It's completely understandable. And moreover, and this is a fascinating uh, new study, literally just published this month. It is good. We are reinforced to think that we are free agents and full of, quote, free will. Jonathan Schuler did this experiment with Kathy Vos, where he took a group of students and he had them read a deterministic paragraph. It was actually written by Francis Crick, the great biologist. We're all determined and yada, da 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 right? Students read that, this group of students read that, and this group of students over here read a, a, a paragraph on, on how undetermined we are, how free we are. So they just innocently are reading this, waiting to play a game. And the game that they were about to play allows you to cheat, okay? So you can cheat in this game to gain more money if you, if you do. Well, guess what? The people that read the deterministic chapter, you know, we're all just robots going to work and living, they cheated their heads off. And the person that read the uplifting, you know, free, choose, moral choice, didn't cheat. So it is very valuable to believe and to practice, according to these studies, in the notion that we are acting free and are personally responsible. Now, I happen to think uh, we are, and I'll tell you why. But the current legal view of the mind is, is very consistent uh, with, with, with these notions. Uh, and and here, here is the legal view of the mind, which is that we're all practical reasoners. And in order to, to, to understand behavioral, you, you assume that the person is a reasoning from inputs to them, and they're working freely in a normal, healthy brain. And then, so the notion is that personal responsibility is a product of a normally functioning brain. And along comes an injury, a lesion, a neurotransmitter disorder, a trauma, a stress, what, whatever. Doing some damage to the brain, it is totally sensible that that should make the person who's carrying out a behavior not responsible for it because now there's a disruption in the brain. So neuroscientific evidence is very powerful in the courtroom. And there are actually there, there are studies that demonstrate if you say neuroscience to anything, it's all of a sudden more serious. It's a problem. And should we, should we allow brain scans showing someone has a lesion uh, to be used in this manner? Well, starting in, in 1982, a, a Pennsylvania judge sentenced uh, a man named Simon Perella to death for first degree murder. He uh, was not a nice, uh, did not a nice thing. He gave battery acid and orange juice to somebody and killed them. And later, as he was going through the judiciary system, uh, it was determined that he had a brain lesion and the argument was that therefore he wasn't making his act willfully free, free and he was, uh, he was uh, considered uh, not, did not receive the death penalty. The same issue was brought up, of course, in the assassination attempt of, of President Reagan when John Hinckley was argued to have an abnormal brain, suffered from schizophrenia because of a brain scan that was finally admitted into the trial that suggested he had uh, schizophrenia and dilated lateral ventricles. So the notion that you're not responsible because of a brain lesion is very much part of the thinking uh, currently uh, in American law. But there's a problem with it, and this is the point. The, the problem with it, this is where I think neuroscience is too early to make these claims. The problem is there are all kinds of people with these lesions that have, let's say, uh, left 
frontal lesion. This is the famous case of Phineas Gage, who had a, a spike blown through his head and disinhibited him, and he had some violent changes in behavior. The problem is, though, that if you look at a hundred such cases or a thousand such cases, the violence only goes up a little bit from baseline. In other words, 3% of 100 people are violent in the normal population. What about the left frontal lobe patient? Maybe 6%, 7%, maybe a little higher. It's not a switch. It's not that when you have a lesion there, you automatically become violent. So it doesn't make sense that this is an iron type case, that just because there's a lesion in the brain, you should allow someone to be exculpable or to, to use exculpability, uh, 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 that kind of data for exculpability. Schizophrenia is the same story. Higher interest of, uh, of uh, schizophrenics uh, in, in prison, and yet there's no higher incidence of violence on the part of schizophrenics than from the normal population. So how, it's an insult almost to schizophrenics to say that uh, that is a, 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 an excuse for a schizophrenic who might have committed a crime. So the, the suggestion is that maybe we're not looking in the right place to determine this responsibility question. Maybe we should think of it another way. And here's the metaphor. So cars are automatic, right? They're all set systems and they all behave me mechanically. And yet you can't figure out traffic moving around a circle by looking at a car. It's not, it's all mechanistic, but that's not what's happening. There's another level there's another story of all the interaction of those elements. Well, maybe the same is true here with the responsibility. Brains are automatic. Let's say the neuroscientists win this, and they show it's automatic. Well, analysis of brains cannot illuminate the capacity for responsibility. That's a dimension that comes from social interaction. So the argument is that if you are the only person in, in the world, you're the only person in the world. There's no need for personal responsibility. Responsibility to whom? No one's here, right? So it's when more than one person starts filling up the world that you begin to have the need for the concept of personal responsibility, and it's a rule. And you can learn the rule, and the group can obey the rule, and so responsibility is in the rules of the social group. It's not to be found in a pixel or in a place in the brain. So those who use neuroscience now to argue for exculpability, I think, have a ways to go before that's the case. But there's another aspect, and this is the building on the maxim of uh, Sir Edward Cook, even though it sounds like it should be pronounced Cook, Sir Edward Cook's maxim. <laughs> and it's central to American criminal law. Octus non facet ros nisi men sit rea. If you put that into a computer program to translate, it comes out with that first thing. <laughs> Moving through not the making definite, if not mind, he is right. If you're, if you're trying to remember why you did so poor in Latin in school, maybe you didn't, I did. But anyway, that's all been cleaned up now. And what that means, the act does not make a person guilty unless the mind is also guilty. So if, if I pull a trigger and shoot somebody, unless I have a guilty mind, uh, the act itself is not what's uh, a problem. So in, he introduced this doctrine of men's ray, the guilty mind. And to have a guilty mind, there has to either be purpose, uh, purposefulness in the act Knowledge that it's, it's wrong, but you're doing it anyway. Recklessness, but you, you're taking unnecessary risk or negligence. You have one of those states, then you have a guilty mind. And if you, you, you should have known better is the argument. And with that, retribution is fine, is acceptable. If you knowingly do something bad, you, you can have, the, the society, the group can, can uh, deal with it in a, in a retributive sort of way. 
Well, there's people who don't like that because they say, famous uh, cases and quotes here, to blame a person is to express moral criticism. And if the person's action does not deserve criticism, blaming him is a kind of falsehood and is to the extent the person is injured by being blamed unjust to him. This lies behind the law's excuses. So if we can say, yeah, but the person didn't intend to do this, then to blame him or to punish him is, is not, doesn't seem morally right. Or in the Holloway case, to punish a man who lacks the power to reason as an un undignified and unworthy as punishing an inanimate object or animal. A man who cannot reason cannot be subject to blame. So what this says is we now have to know the intentional state of the rule follower. And guess what? There's research going on that's beginning to understand, they, people feel, that this is all an argument. This is, this is just happening as we all sit here. But they're fascinating studies and they're well done and they're done by serious scientists. That um, there are areas in the brain involved with intention and that they can be isolated and discovered. In this first study by Lau, he has two conditions where he asked people to attend to their intentions versus not. And particular brain areas light up are activated when that happens. And so the question becomes, well, if there are lesions in that area, maybe the person carrying out the rule doesn't have the intention to. And could that be a, a exculpable uh, piece of data? There, and there, there's more. Uh, I, 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 won't, I won't go into the others. Uh, so the, the basic thing, there's another part of the brain uh, my colleague Scott Grafton is studying, uh, the angular gyrus, which allows you to reflect on action plans. You're going to do something, and you can think about it before you do it. But maybe that part of the brain is damaged. So maybe you're planning to do a criminal act, but you're not comparing it and, and so forth. So uh, the, the, the issue really is more research is needed, but people are going to start examining from a cognitive neuroscience point of view, the intentional state to following a rule. Okay, how are we doing on time? The, uh, the next bit of evidence is really that given that we're moving towards uh, understanding more about the mechanisms of these very complex mental states, how difficult a job will it be for neuroscience to do this when it comes down to an individual, it comes down to that person right there versus the, the group. It's gonna be difficult and let me tell you why. There's this problem of individual variation in brain organization and brain activity. And it goes like this. Here's a, here's a simple brain image of you see in the papers all the time and you, and you know about them if you're a, a scientist. That is a, an average brain, that's 16 people's brain activations averaged into one pretty picture there. And if you're doing this particular kind of memory task of, uh, of trying to remember a list of words, those are the major areas of your brain that appear activated. Now there's a problem with this simple, clean picture. Problem is, if you look at the 16 subjects that went into that study, you notice there's activations all over the brain. A little different here than this person, than this person, than this person. And importantly, if you bring these people back six months later, as we see here, here's subject SC, there's their profile on day one to this task, and you bring them back six months later, they're pretty much the same. So they have a specific way their brain is activated to carry out this task. And in another person, it's a different set of arrangements in the brain. So how are we gonna be able to use a brain imaging study on this person <coughs> unless we know all, everything we need to know about their brain? One particular study isn't going to do it in a court of law. And there's a new twist to this. Most of us forget the fact that the really important part of the brain 
are the connections. So here's a rat brain, and you see these little, this thin uh, a line of, of, of white, white matter here. These are the connections between the hemispheres. Now look at the human brain. Human brain seems to be nothing but connections. It's just a gazillion connections. Long tracked anatomy, in, in, it's called in some way. And up until two years ago, three years ago, we couldn't really study its specificity at all because there were, the techniques were not available, certainly in the living brain. They just simply were not available. Well, now there's a new technique called diffusion tensor imaging that very cleverly allows you to track these nerve fibers, where they're going, how they're turning around corners, uh, and the like. And in work that we're doing in our lab, I want to give you one very recent example. In fact, so recent that this slide was made four days ago. Here's the lateral picture of the brain of the parietal lobe. And here are three regions in that part of the brain, indicated in the red, the angular gyrus, and the blue, the post-supermarginal gyrus, and the green, uh, uh, the anterior uh, supermarginal gyrus. For our purposes, it's the red, the blue, the green, all right? That part of the brain. And we want to know what the connections between that part of the brain are going through this corpus callosum, this thing that was cut. And so you now can take uh, four normal people and study which part of the callosum carries fibers from those red, blue, and green parts of the brain. And moreover, you can see from the graph here four different subjects, and you see how much they vary in the amount of information that's being transmitted from that brain, that area in the brain in Mr. Jones versus Mr. Smith versus Mrs. Smith and so forth. So not only are you going to be dealing, the neuroscientists and the lawyer are going to be dealing with the variations in activation, but you're now going to be dealing with the variation in the connections from those activations. So it's going to be a very complex argument. Okay, and I think because of time, I will uh, skip uh, this. It has to do with the issue of brain death and uh, persistent vegetative state. But it's a, we can do it in questions uh, if necessary. So let's look at this issue of a psychological bias that may be brought into the courtroom. The law makes a promise of neutrality. If the promise gets broken, the law as we know it ceases to exist. This was a comment of Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. Everybody thinks the judge is not biased. Everybody thinks the witnesses aren't biased. Everybody thinks the jury is not biased. But is there bias? And the answer, of course, is of course there's biases. But can we be specific about them? It was just made very national news in America for a few years in uh, this Duke lacrosse case where uh, the, the Duke uh, college players were accused of, uh, of, of raping a, a woman. And uh, the woman was black and the, uh, the college players were all white. So it was a very volatile issue. And uh, it turns out these, these uh, young men were all falsely accused. It, it was not true. Well, how can we explain that? Uh, is this a factor? And there's something called the own race memory bias, ORB. And what does this mean? It's real simple. Uh, a, a particular race, Caucasians are very good at judging the subtleties of other Caucasians. They're very bad at judging the subtleties of blacks or Japanese or Chinese or a, another, another group. And conversely, blacks are very good at judging blacks but are very bad at judging the subtle differences between whites. So they falsely recognize, whites falsely recognize blacks, blacks falsely recognize whites, and so forth. You get the idea. This has been known for years and used in courtrooms many times. But along comes neuroscience, and we can show that this own race bias is a particular mechanism located in a particular part of the brain. So it takes on a reality and a utility 
that will be used in judging the legitimacy of a witness report, as it was uh, uh, the arguments were made in this uh, Duke case. And then finally on this point, and this is even subtler, the, their, uh, uh, Susan Fisk at, at Princeton and her colleagues are looking at how the brain responds to particular sets of stimuli. And if you are looking at faces that uh, are demonstrating pride or envy or pity, the brain my brain looking at your face that may be expressing that emotion is good at detecting it. And personally, don't treat that person any different than if it was a block of wood or an inert object. In other words, there's no empathetic mechanisms with respect to that person. So we have dehumanized certain people, and yet they're there with the hope of getting a free trial. So are those kinds of things going to be used in extreme cases in the courtroom? I think they will happen. So finally, this field of, that's, that's blossoming and, and very exciting and we will be dealing with uh, in the years to come. And that's this field of social neuroscience. This picture was uh, given to me by uh, uh, John Tooby, a colleague, uh, and he points out that that uh, cognitive neuroscience knows an awful lot about this guy, this soldier who they've survived this battle, this gun battle, and he's doing the dog tags and marking names down and tabulating and using all the kind of cognitive processes that uh, we know and love. And uh, this social scene here is really where the action is, though. The, what do we know about reciprocal uh, emotional states what do we know about uh, the social processes that we humans uh, so actively use, <coughs> excuse me, uh, all day long? What, wh why is it, I like to put it this way, why is it that, and this is always seems surprising to people, we have to remember that why is it that six billion people kind of get along in the world, you know? We're not all shooting each other. And, and why, why is it we, we, we can basically walk from here anywhere and navigate in this social world? Well, the, is, the issue is that maybe we have common moral, we make common moral judgments that as a human, as a species, we respond to moral questions in the same way. And this was studied, is being studied very actively, and this particular uh, experiment was done by Mark Hauser uh, at Harvard. Uh, and uh, he asked uh, a group of uh, people throughout the world, different cultures, different ages, different religions, different, different everything, he gave them a problem. He wanted to see how they would respond to it. And it's called the trolley problem. Many of you are familiar with this, but many of you are not, I'm sure. Uh, and so the first problem he gives the world is this. Um, Denise, you can read it there. Denise is a passenger on a train whose driver has fainted. On the main track ahead are five people. The main track has a side track leading off to the right, and Denise can turn the train onto it. There is one person on the right-hand track. Denise can turn the train, killing the one, or she can refrain from turning the train and letting the five die. This is actually probably a, in Switzerland. <laughs> happens all the time. Uh, <coughs> so, I just came back from one. Anyway. So, uh, so the question is, is this morally defensible for Denise to pull the levers, kill the one, save the five? Well, 89% of the people in the world say, yes, that's okay. That's a, that makes good sense. Okay, so that's judgment one. Now, what about judgment two? Frank is on a footbridge over the train tracks. He sees a train approaching the bridge out of control. There are five people on the track. Frank knows that the only way to stop the train is to drop a heavy weight into its path. But the only available sufficiently heavy weight is a large man also watching the train from the footbridge and also could be Swiss. Frank, 
Frank can shove the man onto the track in the path of the train, killing him, or he can refrain from doing this and let the five die. So both cases, five could die, one could die. All right. But this requires Frank to push the guy over the bridge. Well, now, all of a sudden, the people of the world say only 11% only say that's okay to do. Now, what's that? Well, so then Jonathan Cohen and Josh Green at Princeton basically did this experiment in a brain scanning environment and had a set of findings that argued in the up close and personal case here, your emotional circuits are activated. There's sort of moral breaks in your brain. Come on. Say, no, you, you, don't, you don't do that. You don't do that thing. Now, interestingly, in both of these cases, the, if you then ask the person, they've responded, they're part of the 89 or they're part of the 11, you ask them why, and everybody has a different reason and a different story. And I think it's the interpreter working from a different cultural background, different life experience, and so forth. So they tell a different story as to why. But the issue, the underlying issue is, are there these circuits built into the brain that are really driving the case here? And to see how this works, I will show you a piece of film that argues that while there may be, we may be, have these emotional responses, but we then tell a different story or we tell a story as to why. And this is a piece of film about from one of the split brain patients I studied many, many years ago. Case NG. And what I did was, uh, what I'm, you'll see is I show her a, a picture that makes her laugh in her right hemisphere. And she laughs. And then I ask her why. And she said, well, I didn't see, well, she, we established she didn't see, she said, I didn't see anything. But she's laughing. Huh? Well, why are you laughing? Oh, she says, you have a funny machine there. You guys come out and test me all the time. <laughs> So I argue this is what we're doing, that, that we have tendencies. We have maybe emotional responses. They are triggered. And then we try to build a story as to why we're feeling that way. So here it is with, with uh, Case NG. And in the first part, she's looking at the machine. I show her a picture of a spoon to the right hemisphere. Ask her what she sees. And she says, nothing. It's very boring, uninteresting. Then to her right hemisphere, I show a picture of a pinup girl. What did you see? <laughs> Don't know. Why are you laughing? Well, because you have a funny machine there. So, so the, the, it's easy to say that we have these responses, and then it's easy to figure out that we all have different stories as to why why we do it. And this whole field of, of social neuroscience is going to start to lay bare what's built into us and what's not. What can be manipulated in the brain and what doesn't seem yet to be uh, manipulated. And I just wanted to throw up two examples from, uh, from Swiss scientists, uh, the very exciting work of Professor Fair looking at issues at reciprocal fairness and showing that there seem to be particular areas in the brain that you can temporarily knock out and influence how you judge whether something is fair or not. You should hear his work from his, his own mouth. It's fantastically interesting. And the work from uh, another Swiss scientist uh, visiting our lab, uh, or our, our larger group under Dr. Grafton, uh, Stephanie Ortiz, who's studying the great unconscious areas, the, how priming experiments can be used to bias uh, ultimately uh, moral judgments. So this field is, is blossoming, it's booming, it's lots of activity going on, and it's going to greatly influence, I think, how we think about uh, our moral judgments. So finally then, we c come full circle back to this, this question of justice, of determinism, how we want to think about it, and the question of retribution uh, and, uh, and possibly, if we are determined, should we just simply forgive? And 
course, retribution is a very complex topic. John Cunningham's famous paper says how many really issues are going on when we th think that we're being retributive with respect to somebody or something. And the notion of payback, the notion of retribution is contrasted by probably one of the most provocative lectures in the history of man, the Sermon on the Mount, where Christ comes along and says, forget all that stuff, just forgive people. And what's ironic about this is that the real message, of course, of, the, of, of many of the great religions of the world is that uh, you're free to choose. And if you're free to choose, then you're accountable. And if you're accountable and you still do something bad, you can be punished. But in fact, with determinism, it is those who are believers in the literal full strength of the deterministic argument that punishment makes no sense, that blame makes no sense because it's just what's going to happen. And so on the one hand, the person arguing for kind of no punishment is the person who's there, the body of, of, of thought is that those are the people who believe in the concept of free will and free choose. Uh, uh, free to choose. So these dilemmas are deep, they're profound, they're fascinating, and they're alive. And I think that the, I'm trying to tell you two things. I'm trying to tell you that neuroscience should be used in very careful, controlled ways now and frequently not used at all. But only a fool would not see what's coming. And that as we get our foothold on more knowledge about the mechanistic ways of the brain, all these issues are going to really be profoundly important to our sense of justice and uh, how we want to, to handle the legal system. I leave with this final note from Janet Radcliffe Richards, who wants, who's kind of giving the neuroscientists, the biologists, Maybe a little too much here, but here's the question she raises. If we understand that there are good evolutionary reasons for our wanting people to suffer when they have done direct or indirect harm to us, then we can account for our strong feelings about the appropriateness of retribution without presuming they are a guide to moral truth. We may be able to recognize our retributive feelings as deep and important aspects of our character and take them seriously to that extent without endorsing them as a guide to truth and start rethinking our attitudes towards punishment on that basis. So she wants to move on from what she may say is our biology here. And that's a big idea and I don't know if it has, as we say, legs or not. But I wanted to conclude with the point that, that uh, as I said before, it's a a time of dynamic change in this field, and it's a time when people sh uh, of all trainings should be in on this conversation. This should not be going on in the corner. And so on the occasion of the Center for Neuroscience opening up here, uh, I hope I've brought to you one of the reasons why these institutions are so important. Thank you very much. <laughs>
many of the tests that were being carried out were actually um, had to do with quite simple um, reactions of people. I mean, it's there's clearly a difference between you doing something automatic or responding to something you, s you see instead of, for example, reasoning and deciding on something. I mean, really making a choice based on values. So I'd like to know if there's also, whether there have been any experiments. Like, for example, when you're thinking about how do I choose what I want to study, there are a lot of different values and reasons that play into that. So how do you make the difference between that and automatic? Yes. Um, well, the, uh, the, when one uh, describes these simple experiments, uh, it is the way of uh, science, as you know, to take a very complex thing and try to reduce it to a simple form so you can study it. And what you want to be careful of is that you don't lose the phenomenon in the simplicity of the uh, experiment that you're running. Uh, but uh, so you, you, you the, the issue then is uh, to be aware of that and to, uh, and, and, and to then see what your model would predict. And so the model would be that no one is, uh, certainly nothing I've said, uh, the, would subtract out values, would subtract out past experiences, would subtract out what you've learned. All those are factors going into the decision. How that works actually in the brain uh, uh, is not truly known. But they know these dis the information from many mo uh, multimodal sources can come in and influence a particular final decision. So people study that, they understand those mechanisms, it's beautiful work, and then you simply conclude that these things that we know psychologically act in a similar way. So you, you have to start somewhere and you start with these, uh, uh, these, these reduced down models to try to get to the larger mental questions that, that you're raising. And the notion again is that uh, even though you are sitting there thinking that you, and, and are, judging, making decisions on your prior knowledge, your prior value system. Uh, no one is taking that away from the nature of the decision you're making, not in this argument. Yes. Oh, maybe one for that. Vous avez fait allusion à la mort cérébrale. J'ai invité à vous poser des questions à ce sujet. Can you repeat the question? It's about brain death, but... What, uh, plus de détails, en fait. So this gentleman was asking for more details about brain death. Oh, the brain death. You know what? Well, maybe just to uh, this, uh, this is worth... Uh, here's everything you need to know about brain death. The uh, Vatican just had a, uh, another session uh, uh, on brain death to, to re-examine uh, how they, the Catholic position on moral, moral philosophy of, of this whole issue. And it's interesting to know the history of the acceptance of brain death as a criteria for organ transplantation. It actually, uh, the moral reasoning was led by the Catholic Church. Pope Pius XII uh, concluded that brain death was an acceptable concept and uh, added to it that no, since no greater love can a man give than his life for another, uh, that the notion of organ transplantation to, to someone who was irreversibly suffering brain death was uh, okay. So that's been in place for 25, 30, 40 years now. And, uh, and, uh, and so it was being re-examined. And one of the participants of that uh, meeting a year or so ago was Dr. Jerry Posner, who's one of the leading uh, neurologists uh, in the world. And he makes, summarizes this conference and just sort of wrote out these points. And each one of them is interesting. So all death, he points out, is brain death. If the brain dies, but other organs are preserved, that individual 
is still dead. And he points out, death is a process. The process begins when the integrative functions of the entire brain and the brain stem fail. That's as any neurologist knows. The process ends when every cell in the entire body is dead. Death is pronounced during the process when irreversibility, that's the key concept, is established, but not all cells are brain. So when you're brain dead, and actually when your heart uh, stops too, your fingernails keep growing. Well, are you, uh, you going to wait around for that to stop uh, before you transplant someone's kidney to save somebody's life? So they point out that real brain death, brain death is the exact point where your brain is irreversibly, and that's extremely easy uh, and well worked out by neurologists to determine that. Uh, and uh, technology can preserve the organ of the dead person, so you can keep the heart beating even though the brain is dead. There's famous cases of this, there's some grotesque cases of this. But still, that person is dead because there's no retrieving the brain. And as, as Dr. Posner pointed out, if heart beating death defies our common sense perception and is counterintuitive, I love this line, so is the fact the earth is not flat. So uh, uh, brain death is determined, it can be defined, and he doesn't know of a single case in the history of Western medicine, which is the literature uh, read, that violates uh, these standards. Pe pe persistent vegetative state is a different story, and that the neurologists have not yet nailed down. Maybe a last question on a more positive uh, note. <laughs> Good evening. Here. Good evening. Okay. Um, I understand you learn a lot from uh, minorities and uh, special cases. And uh, I would be very uh, thankful to you if you could elaborate on uh, what you learn from left-handed people. Ah. Uh, in, the, in the context of split brain research, or just in general? Uh, my older brother, who's much stronger than I am, is left-handed. So I've always, and he's much richer, and there's a long list of things that he is. Uh, but I don't attribute it to his left hand. There are well-known differences in brain organization to left-handers. Their distribution of their language and speech centers is quite different. It's not a, just a complete opposite. There's, a, there's a more of a mixed dominance. And there's a, there's a whole series of things that uh, are different about uh, the, the, the central nervous system organization to left hand, uh, being left-handed. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it's, uh, and, and there's, our, there's been the late, uh, well, the famous neurologist Norman Geshman thought there were differences in the immune system associated with left-handedness, left difference in judging spatial abilities, and, and there's, there's a big literature on that if you're interested in it. Well, maybe because of time we're going to stop now, and thank you again very much for this uh, lecture. You.